Yo ho ho! Hands up who wants a review on differentiation? Let's do this then. Here is lesson 13. It is the review lesson. It is nothing new. It's just all the key points from the other lessons. If there's anything you're unsure of though, you're best going back and looking at the lessons individually, as this does not include every slide or every example. Away back at the start then, I gave you an introduction to differentiation and I was telling you it's something that we look into a little more in advanced higher with differentiation from first principles. So if you want a little bit more information, look back to that. What you need to know though for higher is, drumroll, differentiation is a way of finding out the rate of change of one variable with respect to another. Its main purpose is to find the gradient of a curve at a certain point, which you can apply to find stationary points in a curve, or you could find out the velocity or acceleration, vroom vroom. The notation that you use is if you're given f of x, you would use f dash x. If you're given y in terms of x, you'd have dy by dx. If you're given k in terms of m, you'd have dk by dm. How do you differentiate a function though? Well, you multiply by the power and then decrease the power by one. If you are given a constant though, such as 7, that can also be written as 7x to the power of 0. Remember, anything to the power of 0 is 1, so it's 7 times 1. If you decrease the power though, if you multiply by the power, you'd have 7 times 0, which gives you 0, which means if you differentiate a constant, you always just get 0. I gave you some examples. Remember, this is not all the examples. Look back to that lesson if you want more. But the example five was differentiate m equals, and then you had a function in terms of g. So you would work out dm by dg. With this one, you had brackets. So we had x add five all squared. First thing to do is if you've got brackets, you multiply them out. So multiply out the brackets, and then once you've done that, differentiate. So we're only bringing in f dash x when we differentiate. With this example, we had to evaluate f dash 2. So you differentiate and then set, uh, replace x with 2. So that's how you can evaluate. From there, we looked at the rules of indices. This was a recap from National 5. This was what you learned all the way back then. Uh, this one with flower power, if you've got the nth root of a to the power of m, the way I always remember which number goes at the top and which one goes at the bottom is think about flower power. At the bottom of a flower, you've got the roots, which means the nth root, the n will go at the bottom. And it's a to the power of m, and the power rhymes with flower, which is on the top, so that number will go on the top. A lot of the time in differentiation, you will have to subtract one from a fractional index. And there's a quick way of doing that. Yes, there is. So if you have three over two minus one, you do three, take away two, and then that gives one, and then you're working with halves. If you have negative four fifths, take the negative with the four. So you do negative four, take five, which is negative nine, and keep it as fifths. So that is a quick way of subtracting one from a fraction, which you can then apply to the harder questions. Remember though, you cannot differentiate if you have x in the bottom of a fraction. No, no, no. And you have to change any square root signs to fractional indices. Oh yes. So something like this, if you have one over x cubed, you would have to rewrite that first of all as x to the power of negative three, because x is in the bottom of a fraction, you cannot differentiate straight away. And make sure on the left, you don't write f dash x. We're not differentiating, we're just rewriting it before we differentiate. There was further differentiation after that, so you had more complicated problems such as this. And if you end up with something like this example, you can either take x up to the top line and multiply out the brackets, or you could split it up so you've got each of the terms over x and then simplify. So some of the questions, there'll be more than one way of doing them as long as you get the right answer. We then looked at the main purpose of differentiation and we found that was to work out the gradient of a curve at a certain point. And the gradient of that curve at that point is the exact same as the gradient of this tangent. So if you differentiate, you will get the gradient of the tangent. And if you want the equation of the tangent, ooh, then you can use gradient point equation just from the straight line chapter. Ooh, some revision.
So if you had something like this, a parabola has that equation, work out the gradient and the equation of the tangent. First of all, differentiate to get the gradient. Replace x because you know what x is, and that will give you a number, so you know the gradient will be something. After that, think gradient point equation. You've got the gradient, but you need to know the point. If you know x, you can sub it in to the starting equation to work out y, and that will then be the point. And then think gradient point equation. Woohoo! Increasing and decreasing functions. If a graph slopes down from left to right, it is decreasing, meaning the neg it will have a negative gradient. If the graph slopes up from left to right, it will be increasing, and the gradient will be positive. So if you differentiate, if you get the derivative, if it's a positive, it means the graph is increasing, it's going up at that point, and if it's a negative, it will be decreasing, it will be going down at that point. We did a couple of examples, finding out if a function is increasing or decreasing when x is 4. So you differentiate, replace x with 4, and depending on what number you get, will depend on if it's increasing or decreasing. Because we've got a positive value, that function is increasing. We sometimes have to work out the interval, so the range of values for which x would be, for example, increasing. So again, you differentiate and then set the derivative to be bigger than zero because we know it's increasing when x would be uh, when the derivative would be bigger than zero. So again, you can work out the range of values for x. We then looked at stationary points and their nature. What are stationary points? Well, stationary points are where the gradient is zero. And you could have one of four options. You could have a minimum turning point, looking something like this. You could have a maximum turning point, looking something like that. You could have a rising point of inflection, which is something like that. Or you could have a falling point of inflection. Something like that. With your rising point of inflection, you see that just before the gradient is zero, it is an increasing function, and just after it's also increasing. So uh, rising point of inflection would go increasing, and then zero, and then increasing again. Where is the falling point of inflection would be decreasing, and then zero, and then decreasing again. And the way you find stationary points is, you'll remember this phrase, stationary points occur when dy by dx equals zero, when the derivative is zero. We did some examples then, find the stationary points on the curve and determine their nature. So first thing you have to do is think stationary points occur when dy by dx equals zero. So differentiate, woohoo! After that set it equal to zero, woohoo! Find the values of x, and once you find these values of x, you need to know if they are the maximum turning point, minimum turning point, point of inflection, and to do that, use the nature table. So use two nature tables if you get two stationary points, and to work out if they're maximum or minimum, take a value just before and just after. So pick a value just before negative one, sub it into the derivative, and pick a value after and sub it into the derivative. From there you can work out if it's a maximum or a minimum or a point of inflection. What you also have to do if you're asked for the actual point is to work out the y value. So once you know x, sub it into the original equation to work out y. Uh, do that this again for this one, and then you can work out that you've got a maximum stationary point here and a minimum stationary point here, or whatever you end up with. We can take that a stage further and we can sketch some curves. Yes! So to do that, what you need to do is you need to work out the stationary points and their nature, and then you need to work out where the graph will cross the x-axis and the y-axis. So for example, if you sketch this, Work out the stationary points by differentiating, setting equal to zero, finding the value of x. Work out if it's a maximum or a minimum using the nature table. And once you've done that, work out where the graph crosses the y-axis by setting x equal to zero. Work out where it crosses the x-axis by setting y equal to zero. And then you will get these points. Take all those points and you should be able to work out what your graph will look like. And you can do a little sketch looking something like that. After that, we were looking at the maximum and minimum in a closed interval. So for your closed interval, that is when x is going between, for example here, it's going between a and b. And your maximum and minimum value, in other words, the highest and the lowest point on that graph, will either be at the turning points, as you can sometimes see, or it will be at the end points of the function. So we also have to work out the value of y at the end points. So to do that, if you had this interval here between negative 1 and 8, you would just replace x 
with negative 1 and 8 to work out the endpoints, to work out the values at the endpoints. Once you do that, do the stationary points the exact same way that we did, and then you can compare your answers. So look at the endpoints, look at the y values, that's the value of the function, look at the stationary point, that's the value of the function, and then you want to see which is the highest, or which is the lowest, or whatever you are asked for. If you graph that one, that's what you would get. We then went on to look at optimization. Optimization. And optimum really means the best possible. So when you're asked for the best possible result, it's normally going to be the maximum or the minimum that you would look for. And a lot of this a lot of these questions relate to volume or area or various other companies and production costs and profits and so on. The way you work that out, though, is the exact same. You differentiate and set their derivative equal to zero. I gave you five examples on that. I'm not going to go over them here. If you want them in more detail, look back to the optimization video, all 36 minutes of it. That was example one, and then we had the answers. That was example two, and then we had the answers. We had example three, which was getting a little bit harder, and again, the answer to that. And then example four. Example four and five, what you had to do with these ones, though, is you had to come up with this formula. And to do that, these are the tricky bits with optimization. So for that, we were asked to work out the area. So you can say the area equals. It's normally something that you can uh, work out how to do it. So you would come up with your own formula. But what you'll come up with is a formula that includes a letter that is not in the answer that you're wanting. So you have to find what that letter is equal to. And to do that, you look at the other information you're given in these problems. For example, here, we're also told the volume, so we can work that out and get H. Once we know what the height is, we can replace it back here and then come up with the formula that we're asked for. Part B is just the exact same as we did for examples 1, 2, and 3. We differentiate, set the derivative equal to 0, and then we can work out whatever it is we are asked for. Example 5, again, was one of these ones. We had to work out the formula, first of all, before we came up with a maximum or minimum. So again, it's one of the ones where you think, well, the area, here's how we do it. Oh, I've got this letter L. I don't know what L is. We'll go off to the side, use the extra information, find out what L is, and then sub it back in, and then come up with the formula you're asked for. Again, part B, for any of these optimization questions, most of the time, Part B is just going to be differentiate. So you differentiate, set the derivative equal to zero, and then find your answer. We then moved on to displacement, velocity, and vroom, acceleration. Displacement is really just the distance from the origin at time t. The velocity is the rate of change of displacement with respect to time. In other words, how quickly you're moving away from a point. And the acceleration is how quickly you're changing your velocity. In other words, the rate of change of velocity with respect to time. Basically, if you differentiate displacement, you get velocity. If you differentiate velocity, you get acceleration. So we had some of those examples. And that was them. We then moved on to sketching the derivative. And to sketch the derivative, you have to think about the original graph and the gradient. So you split it up using the stationary points. And then think before the stationary point, there's a negative gradient. And if there's a negative gradient on the derivative, uh, you would sketch a graph below the x-axis. If it's a positive gradient, you know you're going to have something above the x-axis. And again, negative would be below the x-axis. But for the turning points, there's a zero gradient. So you would mark those points on the x-axis. For example, with this one here, you had turning points when x was negative 1 and when x is 3, so you'd mark those points in the x-axis. What you're graphing is the derivative, so this here is f dash x, and the derivative, remember, is equal to the gradient. So because there's a negative gradient before negative 1, then the line is going to be below the x-axis in the negatives. Between negative 1 and 3, there's a positive gradient, so you have a line above the x-axis between negative 1 and 3. So you get something that looks something like that. And then after, there's a negative gradient, so again you'll have a line below the x-axis looking something like that. 
That was it for the differentiation chapter. We do a lot more of this in advanced hire, where you look at differentiation in a lot more depth. But with hire, this is everything that you need to know. There is a tiny, tiny little bit uh, later on in Unit 3, but that's mostly everything you need. Give these questions a shot in the Maths and Action book on page 82. Try the review lesson. Any problems? Uh, just let me know. But good luck. You should be able to answer all the questions. Bye! Woohoo! Differentiation. Yeah.